Chris, didn't I? Oh, well, good morning, everybody, and we're glad you're here. And those of you that are listening, I think I need turned down. I'm sounding pretty loud there. Hey, so we go ahead and start with the word because of all the folks that have been listening in online. Um, I guess we're happy we're not seeing as many folks here on church. Maybe we should send out some kind of a message that hits them like, hey, we're, we're starting. Where are you? And do a live. There you go. Uh, the Lord's good, no doubt about that, Amen. right? Amen. Today I was going to talk about some of the reason we love the Lord. Why do you love the Lord? Why do I love the Lord? What has the Lord done for us? And what does our loving God have to do with our walk in this sense of realizing? Uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians chapter 5 that faith works by love. And so our love for God has a lot to do with how much faith we're going to have. And our faith in God has a lot to do with how much we're going to love God. They're reciprocal. And so I pray that you'll understand that this morning. And as, uh, as I say so many times, how often do you tell the Lord that you love him? Uh, many times we'll sit in our room, we're bummed out, we're, you know, we're flabbergasted by things that are going on around us, and God, do you love me? God, do you love me? Yeah. Where really what you should be doing is saying, God, I love you. I love Amen. you. Amen. In the midst of all this, I love you, and I know you're greater than all these things. Amen. This is the reality of the gospel. The Bible says, give and it shall be given <laughs> unto you, right? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall God cause men to give to your bosom? You want to know if you're loved? Love people. Love the saints. Love the body of Christ. Love the Lord above all of that. Uh, gosh, church. Should we go to church? Do we still have to go to church anymore? Well, somebody told me I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Why did the Jewish people go to the festivals of the Lord? We just finished one here, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, the celebration that you were lost out there in the wilderness, but I provided covering for you. Why do they do that? Anybody know? Well, that can be. But how would they know to do that? even though they love the Lord. If you love your husband and he wants a certain type of meal, how does, he, how does he let you know that? He tells you, right? He told the people, these are the feasts of the Lord and I want you to celebrate them, right? And so they celebrate them. He tells us about fellowship. Ah, uh, whether we need it or not, I'll decide, you know, I'll think about it, and maybe I'll get up that time of day, or maybe I'll sleep in, or maybe a shower, or, you know, a, a game, or something else. I'll say, no, God said you're to go to the assembly of the saints, right? The gathering together of the saints. Where would the New Testament of the church been if none of those people were in the upper room? Where would it be if when Peter was preaching... Uh, there were 3,000 some that got saved, where would that be? When Paul preached for hours to where the young man fell out the window, where would the church be if nobody got together for anything? What would they be known for? Breaking bread and fellowship, as it says in the scripture, and their doctrine? No, because nobody would know it. They'd all been recluses off by themselves. And nobody wants to talk reality anymore. We want to talk like everything's always wonderful. Have you noticed it isn't? Have you noticed the times are changing? Things have changed dramatically in the last 15 years. It's like we're living in a different world. So what do we have to do if we say we have to adapt a little bit to all this warfare and this battle and terminology of words and we've got to redefine everything we better pay attention to what's going on how are we going to win the lost if we can't even talk to them we can't relate to them in anything and i don't mean we got to do all the dastardly things they do to be able to say well see i'm just like you i told you a while back when i was at the uh, religious broadcasters convention 
They said, we've got to make our movies more racy to get the people's attention. So now you're seeing stuff in the Christian movies you didn't see before. Well, wait a minute. We're teaching our young girls not to be making out with guys uh, before they're married. And you're showing them in movies now that they thought were safe to watch that it's okay to make out. You know what I mean by make out, right? For some of us older folks, that means hug, kiss, feel, all the other stuff that goes along with that. So what's happening? Do we need to attract them that much that we stoop to all those things? Or is there some kind of power that's in our life that is different? The power of the Holy Ghost, remember the upper room, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the church coming alive again. Remember, it's the resurrection it talked about back there in the Old Testament after uh, two days. And then the third day, I will raise you up. And all of a sudden, God pours out his spirit. There's life back in his people again and more than ever before to go out and evangelize and witness. I said to that fellow in Jerusalem that one day, I never had a Jewish person Come and witness to me about God and try to convert me. So I'm one step ahead of you. I'm out witnessing to anybody I can and trying to get you to convert to the Messiah, the Christ, the coming Lord. Faith which worketh by love, it says in Galatians 5, 6. We believe the Lord more, we hold on more because we love him more. We love him more because we see when we believe him, he has done all these things and he's worthy of our praise. Amen. He's worthy of our love and our appreciation. Amen. Hey, if I don't talk about anything today, I can tell you out of my own heart, I love God. I love the Lord. Amen. I'm willing to take some verbal abuse. I'm willing to, like on the Facebook thing I said before, you don't see my family and all the other stuff and all these little titty bitties of everything round about the world. It's the gospel. That's my first love. And if I lose my first love and start posting pictures of my family and everybody else because I've set my love on them more, they will start to crumble. Because that's what the world does. I don't know if they appreciate that, understand that or not. Uh, how many of you ever think about what will they put on my tombstone when I go? What will they say about me at my coronation, my going home? What will happen among people? Uh, I see a lot of folks lately here, no service, private internment. Uh, you know, everything's like just us. That's it. We don't want anybody else. Listen, I want everybody. I don't think everybody will come, but anybody that will, I want them to hear the gospel. I don't care if you talk about me at my coronation or not. Talk about Christ. I can't save anybody or help anybody. I can hardly help them now, let alone when I'm dead. But Christ can help them no matter what. Amen. Amen? Amen. Faith works by love. Believe in the Lord. Somebody says, how can you stand? I'll say it again. We used to have 600 people almost in this church. Amen. Look at what we got now. Uh, and half of them are hit and miss all of a sudden because something is not working just right. The spirit of the age, the spirit of the world, and people in other churches, other congregations, the same thing. More and more you're hearing about it. You ought to praise God. You're still coming to church. Amen. I used to thank the Lord. Well, all these folks got together and they created an uprising and they didn't invite me. I was happy they didn't invite me. Amen. Must have proved there was something different about me than what they wanted. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. You say I'm a failure, that's okay, I can live with that. I'll go on right through this because of my relationship with Christ. Amen. I'm the guy that said at the meeting one day that uh, somebody jumped up and took off and left and said, that's all I needed to hear. I repeated what we used to be taught in the earlier days, that my relationship with Jesus Christ should be that if I'm stuck on an island somewhere, in other words, there's no more churches here. Now you can say, I don't think I need to go to church. There are no more. I'm stuck on an island somewhere, and I have to have faith in the Lord wherever I'm at that I can do it. Amen. 
Amen. Yeah, a pastor got up from the meeting and said, that's all I needed to hear. Because everybody's unity, everybody's we need each other, we this, that, and the other. Listen, that's okay for a season. But when the time comes that you have to stand on your own in Christ, you better have this love relationship. Amen. You better have this faith that the Bible talks about that works by love. Not by community activity, not by social standing, not by title or deed, because pastors will fall just like anybody else will fall. Amen. Prophets, self-declared prophets, will give false words just like anybody else who speaks off the whim of their mind, saying this has got to be God. Gosh, if I said every dream I ever had was God, I'd be leading you guys I have no idea where we'd be. Every dream, every imagination, every thought, somebody says well, it's got to be God because we have the mind of Christ. No, you have the mind of Christ because it lines up with the gospel. Amen. What Jesus showed us, it lines up. You want to talk about down the road, it lines up with Revelation all the way through chapter 21 to where it's not some imagination you got about some we're all going to be caught up to Pluto, and we're going to be on the ring out there. Is it Pluto that has a ring? Uh, Saturn that has a ring. Uh, some of you Pluto, that's because you watch Disney movies. Uh, Saturn out there, we're going to be dwelling on the ring, and the Lord's going to come and rescue us from... There's nothing in the gospel. Amen. We've got to get to this, and listen, the positive words... I don't know what to say. What, what was in Jesus' mind when he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Amen. Where was his positive words? Why didn't he say, Peter, you're wonderful. You, you got no idea what I'm doing, but Peter, you're glorious. You're, gonna, you're the greatest. You're one of the chief of all these men and leaders and so on. He said, Get behind me. You're being used to the devil. You don't savor the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Where is most of the church? It's after the things of man. It's savoring the things of man. Amen. You know how many people are praying for revival? Not because they want to see people totally changed and converted and evil driven out of their hearts and minds. We want to have our economic status back. We want to be great in the world. I was up there with Pastor Ernie on the radio program. He was going to read out of John chapter 8 there, where they said that we're the seed of Abraham. Listen, we say we're Americans. Can't happen to us. Can't be here. This has to go this way. God, you have to do this. We're America. Why, we started out with a godly foundation. Amen. Listen, Israel started with a godly foundation. Israel was the one God took out of nothing and made to be a nation. Yet they fell. They sinned. They erred. They went away. They strayed. Talk about the wilderness. They died in the wilderness. Yet God said, I'm still going to have a people no matter what. Amen. So what did he do? He started with two guys and some young people that would listen. And he started all over again. And then he gets to the place where Christ dies as our sacrifice. You know, we talk about God being the I am. The Bible says that when the veil was torn in two, it's symbolic of the fact that Christ's flesh, his, his flesh was ripped open for us. That now we have access to the Father through Christ. We don't need the high priest once a year anymore making atonement for us. We have the great high priest. Amen. Whoever lives to make intercession on our behalf. Listen, what is happening that everybody's preoccupied with everything else? What has happened? I've shared where I was stuck in that little restaurant building. I hated it, but I couldn't get it to change. So I had to try to be at peace where I was, even though I wasn't available for anything. But I wasn't late for church on Sunday. Amen. I was here for the gathering of the saints. I couldn't do much other than that. And some days after 12 hours of work, I came to Wednesday night prayer and, and sometimes Saturday night prayer because I just wanted to be here. Yeah. Do we love the Lord that much? Do we love him enough to where, what was it that I think it was Paul who said about one of the men, he's nigh unto death. 
for the cause of the ministry. The guy's working himself so hard in the ministry that he's suffering physically because of it. Will we stress ourselves out for that? Will we strain for that? Uh, these other things, listen, I, w I got up this morning, we had a phone call we didn't want to hear. Uh, we had a plug drain in the kitchen. We just got our dryer fixed. I'm thinking, hey, you know what? If I was in another country, I wouldn't have running water anyway. I wouldn't have a dryer to throw those clothes in. The phone wouldn't have rang. Somebody would have been yelling out in the street. <laughs> I'm not going to let it bother me whatsoever. What is that? A Sunday morning, you're thinking, Lord, I want you to bless this day. I pray for other folks and new souls and people to have their eyes open, their ears unplugged, their hearts softened, and maybe what we really need is, Lord, break us. Yeah. Amen. You know, when we found we were broken, what did you do? Did you say, could you help me? Hey, help me. Please help me, somebody help me. Because you're broken. The Bible says, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. We're going to go there a little bit. Listen, have you gotten past the crying out? Have you gotten past the brokenness of all this? That, Lord, before you, your goodness breaks me. The fact that you brought me to this breaks me. Yeah, I'm broken. I'm just a body and a piece of flesh. You put your spirit in. It's not my strength, my wisdom, my power. It's not my thinking all the time. You bring things. I've been amazed so many times when I'll go to say something and somebody else says the same scripture or brings up the scripture or... Whatever the case, or all of a sudden you're thinking and somebody calls you and it's the person like God's preparing you. Yeah. So listen, this will sound funny. It's nothing mystical. Last night I got home a little later and I looked, I was in the kitchen there and I looked at that drain and I kind of thought, this thing's going to plug up one of these days. When my wife told me this morning, I just went, oh, well, I probably should have got the boiling water and the vinegar and the baking soda out last night and thrown it in there just because I was thinking it. Does the Lord do things like that? Amen. It's nothing to glorify. What do we have that we haven't been given? Right. So what do we got to act like I'm, I'm prophetic? God spoke to me about the sink. <laughs> God told me that sink is going to plug up, so get ready. Well, listen, if he did, make it known. The Holy Spirit's here with every one of us, right? You have the same Holy Spirit that I have. The Holy Spirit can bring all things to remembrance. He can make things known. He can warn us of things to come. You've heard me give you some warnings about what's going on financially. Protect yourself. What's going on food-wise? Do you wish you would have stocked up on food in the beginning of the year? As far as what's happened price-wise and being able to get food and so on? We got to think of all these things. We got to be wise stewards. The Bible Amen. says the children of this world are sometimes wiser than the children of the kingdom. They already bought all their stuff. It's like going to buy plywood the day the storm is going to hit down there in Florida. The plywood's already gone. No, you had to get it ahead of time. Why did he say make sure you have oil in your lamps? Don't wait till the bridegroom, the shout comes. Get the oil now and get ready. Otherwise, he says, you're a foolish virgin. Better to be the wise virgin, right? Because that's what he's done for us. Because he loves us. And all we got to do is love him. And get past this gimme, gimme, gimme thing. I got to have perfect days. Well, I got to have getaways. And I got to have time to get my head together. Well, wait a minute. What's your head thinking about? Because we don't go that way when the Bible says we're sp spiritually minded, right? Spiritually minded is peace and life. And the words he spoke are life, right, and spirit. So what are you really thinking about if you're all messed up as a believer in Jesus? Now, listen, there's a lot of folks out there. They are broken. There's no doubt about it. 
Pray that they can hear some parts of some of these kind of things or other messages and other ministries and other evangelists out there or whatever the case or a neighbor who will walk them by the hand and say, listen, you're broken, but there's help. Uh, when your car is messed up, you call a tow truck. You don't take it yourself a lot of times. You call a tow truck and he takes it to get it fixed. So we're people that are taking other people to get them fixed, to get them help to get them put back together, get them back on the road of life, but now they're on a different roadway, which is Christ. Remember in Proverbs, it talks about that highway to escape from evil. We're getting you on the highway. You don't have to drive through New York City, all the back roads. We can get you up on the highway. You get out of there quick when, excuse me, hell is brewing. Amen? Faith which works by love. The more we love the Lord, the more we will believe him for things, the more we'll expect. That faith means a lively expectation. Yes, it's the uh, things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Without it, we can't please God. When everybody's just hustling and bustling and moving about and whatever comes up in life, we just sort of take it and roll with it or whatever. Are we experiencing, are we enacting any faith in all of that? Are we still expecting other things that we've been praying for to come to pass? Are we expecting changes to happen with situations in people? Have we cast off faith? Is that why the Bible says the time's going to come when Jesus says, when I return, will there be faith in the earth? Listen, you all heard me talk two years ago about the artificial intelligence, AI, and the AI God. And listen, now it's coming out even more so. They're expecting that pretty soon here, you're not going to need to go to church. All you folks that said that about, I don't need to go to church, you'll be happy. You know where you're going to get your church from? You're going to get it through your phone or your internet, artificial intelligence. There's going to be an AI God that's going to answer your questions. But let me tell you something. You're going to lack mercy. You're going to lack compassion. You remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? You do all these of tithes and so on and so forth. But what about mercy? What about justice? Listen, justice is going to be perverted and this AI God is going to make it letter of the law. Watch, watch and see. You violated that. This is what you deserve. No question about, well, let's plead your case. This is what you get for what you did. Cold and dry. Proverbs talks about a generation when they will gnash with their teeth. They'll tear you to shreds. Anybody seen any of that lately? You can't even get words in edgewise. Because there's this gnashing. He's warned us of all these things. He told us the time will come. It'll take a wheelbarrow full of money to get a day's food. What does that mean? Our dollars aren't worth anything as it is right now. When you look at real dollars backed by gold and silver back before the 60s and so on, before President uh, Nixon took us off the gold standard. Think about that. Why is Russia where it's at? What are the, what's really going on with Russia right now? Russia has gold-backed money. Their money's worth more than what we got. And somehow there's war there. Think about all these things. What's really going on in society right now? What have we all dismissed because we've got some glorious thing going on and we think that justifies where we are? Faith, which works by love. Uh, Let's just jump to, I was going to do this later, but let's go to Psalm 116. And you're very familiar with this. But I just, I love to read it. I love to say it. I don't know if I'm good at loving God or not, but I do what I can. I could say I'm not sure I'm good at loving my wife or my kids, but I know I love them. I care about them. I don't want to see them have to go through certain things, Uh, but some things, you know, people have to go through no matter who they are. I'm sure there were days when people looked at me and said, well, he must need to go through that for some reason. It hurt. 
bothered me, whatever. But Psalm 116 says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplication. Listen. Do you really remember ever crying out to God? Do you really remember those days? Do you remember when you felt like, my God, I am so messed up. I don't know what to do. We got a message to pray for somebody yesterday or the day before. Uh, So what, what goes on in that kind of stuff? And what happens when you feel like there's no reason for you and no reason to live anymore when you're really in and I've shared this before about suicidal. Do you just say, okay, God, help me? You know, it reminds me of something I shared a little bit ago when a, a Dr. Ness gave a teaching and he was talking to us. If you remember Dr. Ness, who uh, was with World Evangelism, he said that in the counseling session, uh, they had a husband and a wife, and they told the wife, you know, uh, you're kind of pushing the problem here and so on. And she said, okay, well, tell me what to do and I'll do it. And Dr. Ness, I don't know if you remember this, he said, well, that's really not the right attitude. Like there's no, are you sorry about what's going on? Or do you feel like you could be wrong? There was none of that. It was just tell me what to do. And so you think about that attitude and that mindset And how much of that do we see on a regular basis? Let's go back to America. We have a right because we're Americans. We have a right to expect this lifestyle. We have a right to say that we deserve this much money. Have you noticed how even those that are maybe in some areas of poverty, they have a pride about them. They demand this. They demand that. They demand you take care of them. You know, we see it downtown here with a lot of stuff. As I've said to some of those folks, I said this before. Listen, for 20 or 25 years ago, we were feeding the same people. Something should change. You say they're believers, then something should change. They should at least offer to clean up, offer to assist, offer to do something. You're creating dependence. And isn't that what we've been accused of? As the church, we create, you know, all you people are dependent on the pastor. You've got to worship him. You've got to serve him. You've got to bow down to him. I put an end to all that even if it was true. Amen. I don't ask anybody to serve me personally for anything. I have a hard time even asking people nowadays, hey, can you help us with this and that? Because everybody's so busy with stuff. But should you be that busy with everything else? No. Or should you be of the mindset that, oh, wait a minute, if Christ is first in my life, Shouldn't Christ's things be first in my life? Amen. Shouldn't be the work of the ministry and reaching out to souls and everything? Shouldn't that be more important than whether my sink is clogged for the day? Think about it. I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my supplication, because he inclined his ear unto me. Therefore, will I call on him as long as I live? Listen, I remember crying out in my early days, before I knew the Lord, and I'd been suicidal, I know what that's about, but I remember being in the strangest places and just having like a little breakdown and crying and calling out to God, and I wasn't saying, okay, God, tell me what I have to do. Okay, God, is this what you demand of me? No, I was broken. The Bible talks about, and we used to hear this every so often, The book of Obadiah, chapter 1, verse 3, it talks about the Edomites. You remember the Edomites? They were the descendants of Esau. At a point in time, the Israelites wanted to move through their land, and they said, would you let us move through, and we promise we'll stay on the highway, we'll not go off any of the roadsides or anything or into any of the villages, just let us pass through. And they were told, no, if you come across that border, we will war with you. And God has never forgotten that. So he says in Obadiah chapter 1, he says, the pride of your heart has deceived you. He's talking to the Edomites. He's talking to the unsaved. But listen, all of us have to be cautious with a lot of this stuff. We're talking about loving the Lord. But God looked on the Edomites because of what they did to Israel. And he said, the pride of your heart 
has deceived you. And he says, you that dwell in the clefts of the rock. So he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw you down. And listen, our Americanism doesn't give us the right to be like the Edomites. Our Americanism and our family lineages and all this other stuff or the imaginations of our mind doesn't give us a right to defy the things of God and the people of God, the scriptures, the church. Because he said he'll do it to them. Listen, there was a time when he loved Israel. But he said, I've got to chastise you. I love you, but I'm going to let you fall in the wilderness because you won't obey my voice. You won't keep my sayings. You won't go my way. Why do we go to church? Because God said so. Yes, I know you can be church in your own right. But you know what? You find you're more self-centered now than you were before. Everybody is about their own pride. We got to be careful with this because what does the Bible say about pride? It tells us in the Proverbs, the six things that God hates, yea, seven. Proud look is one of those. Somebody says, well, I don't look proud on people. But if your heart has pride, it's going to be found out. Amen. It's going to be revealed. You know, the Bible says that you can't hide your sin and prosper. It'll get you messed up every time. And many times you'll be the very one to blow it all because you're so proud. It says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Listen, I know God heard me back in those days because I had an older brother that started witnessing to me. I couldn't hear it from him, though. I had to hear it from somebody else. As we can all sometimes testify or attest to that somebody talked to me, but I wasn't going to receive it from them. But then I'd run into somebody else and they'd say something and somebody else. And then at the baseball game downtown Warren, somebody talked to me and I went, my gosh. And then the next thing I know, I'm invited to a meeting and I'm still fighting all this. But I knew the Lord heard me cry out. Listen, how many times... In some of your actions and some of what you do, and that may be us here and it may be some of you out there listening, you're crying out for help. But people can't hear you. You're saying things around people and you're hoping they're going to say, hey, is something wrong? Can I help you? They don't say it. They don't act like they care. They don't act like they're getting it. Anybody remember any of that? But you know what? He said, I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. They didn't, he didn't say to me, well, I'm sorry, I got a bunch of stuff to do. Uh, you know what? Well, you'll have to deal with that yourself. You make your bed, you sleep in it. We should teach that to people. Amen. A lot of people sleep in the bed, but they won't make it when they're done. <laughs> Are we hitting some truth? Yes. The pride of thine heart, he said to the Edomites, has deceived you. Deceived means you're blinded. It means you aren't seeing what you're doing and how rebellious it is and how evil it is. And would you remember back there, man, I really did them evil. Think about it. We talk about asking God for forgiveness of things. And we've done stuff with people, to people, against people, whatever the case. And we've never said, God, I'm so sorry. I really did do that. I really did damage. I really did hurt, whatever the case may be. And what did Jesus tell us? That we need to forgive to be forgiven. Although I know there's those that will say, well, when Jesus died on the cross, our sins are forgiven. Well, but he also said that we needed an advocate down the road in case we sin. And so if he brings sinful things to mind and reminds us, why would the Holy Spirit do that unless we needed to do something about it? And then if he talks about as a man sows, that shall he reap. Well, I did those people tremendous evil. Does that mean it might catch up to you down the road? Be better to repent. Amen. Say, God, forgive me. I didn't know what I did. And then even if it does come around, you might be surprised when you go, hmm, 
I remember what I did, or I did this very same thing to them. Lord, is this you? Are you reminding me, even though I'm not reaping like a judgment or anything like that? I really am forgiven, but thank you. So you may think that nobody hears you crying out, but listen, God hears you. Amen. If you're out there today, listen, you may be messed up. You may be, have gone through the drug scenario, the, the alcoholic, the AA and everything else. Uh, I remember attending some of those meetings with friends. Listen, you may be in all that. You may have lost a loved one and you know you're, you feel despair, broken. I remember as a teenager when my father passed away, it was like life ended. Why, why is the world still going on? Why are people still talking and laughing? We're here at a funeral. I'm blown out of my mind. Why are you able to laugh and everything? Don't you understand? No. But listen, God hears. That's why when you call on the Lord, no matter what's going on with people around us, he hears us. I remember he heard me. And all this time later, I've had my bouts, my ups and downs, my failures in obeying the word and keeping the things of God and so on, just like anybody else. But through it, it's a learning process. I'm supposed to learn. Well, listen, that really hurt. I don't want to do that again. I don't want to go through that again. So if I did this and it brought about that, I'm not going to do this because I'm not going to deal with that. Amen? Amen. So God hears you no matter where you're at and what you're going through and the things you can't talk to anybody else about or you can't get their attention about. Listen, a lot of these folks, when they say they had a breakdown, it's really because they either couldn't receive from anybody or they couldn't get anybody to really listen and do something with them. They need help. A lot of signs show us people need help. We don't have to wait till it gets to the dramatic end of everything. Because he inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Have I seen the Lord bring me through some things? Yes. Have you? Yes. 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 So why would we abandon him now? Amen. Why would we now say, instead of calling on you as long as I live, well, I'm grown up now, God. I'm a big boy now, God. I don't need to like, uh, we have our one young sister that's been coming around. She gets down on her face back there in prayer. Amen. Listen, I, you may not do it here, but I sure pray you can do some of that at home still. Because I've never forgotten those days, or, or, nor are they long gone from me. I remember having a disagreement with a guy who was here in the church. And uh, he said to me the next day, I know what you did. You went home and prayed. He said, because I felt miserable. I was bummed out about what happened. Why would I not go pray? Amen. And that's exactly what I did. And said, God, I'm sorry, this got to be like that. It got pretty ugly and heated on one end of the spectrum while I stood there. And so I went home and prayed. Amen. Apparently he was convicted. Apparently God heard me. Apparently God moved on him. And he was so open at the time he was willing to say so. But listen, the pride of thine heart, Obadiah, that was for the Edomites. It wasn't for us. It was for those who opposed the ways of God, but we've got to be careful that we don't open these doors. In some of our stages, we call it a root of bitterness, right? Beware, at least a root of bitterness springing up in you, uh, and therefore you defile many. You're bitter toward people of God. You're bitter toward parents and family. A lot of the young people, listen, they're bitter toward society. They want it to be some different way. That's why they're on the streets. But listen, would they dare cry out to God and, and pray for change? That's the right thing to do. Amen. That's what we're doing. That's what I did when a guy rose up against me, and I wasn't the pastor then. I was just a guy in the pew like anybody else. I went and prayed. Pray about a lot of things. Pray about deals and things that happen and stuff that goes, and that drain... 
Lord bless that drain. <laughs> because he's inclined his ear unto me, therefore I will or therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. He says, the sorrows of death compassed me. Listen, so many people, you know, we used to go down to the Relay for Life down there and give them all those music videos with some uh, gospel music about the Lord healing and various things. I can only remember one person ever calling and leaving a message and saying, hey, thank you that, you know, I was, I was blessed by that. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. Listen, so even when you're close to death, that pride thing keeps people from crying out to God, keeps people from, listen, and again, all of us, I've listened to people who said, you know, I asked God to forgive me for this and so on before they pass. Uh, where is that in all of us? When the powers of death or death itself has come in close to us the sorrows of death this is the end of my life what's going to go on from here we know we're going to be with the lord but it could look bad this is men of war these are men that stood and so sorrows of death compassed me am i right with god Am I clean in the eyes of the Lord? The one who heard me, the one who kept me, the one who brought me up out of that, remember that miry pit? You know, I kept our dunk tank that I have. I bought a dunk tank that we use at our picnics and different things. I kept the dunk tank because we're going to fill it up with mud. <laughs> and for anybody in the church that thinks you're always clean with God, we're going to put you on that little seat up there and let some of the kids throw those softballs at that target so you can remember what it's like to come up out of the miry pit. When you fall into that muck and that mire, be reminded of the fact that I was so foul and so degenerate and so steeped in sinful things. Amen. I've already offended a bunch of you, haven't I? Because you said I was never like that. Well, what happens to dead people when you put them in a coffin? They deteriorate, right? Amen. Amen. You were dead in trespasses and sin. I'm going to keep saying this too. Because so much of the church needs, needs to be reminded. That's why when people come in these doors that may not be believers, there better be some mercy in us. I'm not worried about how they dressed or if they have their earrings on and their nose clips in or their red, white, and blue hair st sticking straight up in the air. Look past all that and realize inside there's a soul. Amen. And that soul is going to spend eternity either in heaven with the Lord or in eternal torment hoping for somebody to take a drop of water and put it on their tongue. And when you think about that, you look past all that stuff. Amen. Right? Now, somebody newer that come around and they've gone through a lot of stuff, listen, we don't know what they've gone through. We don't know where they've been. You may be 35 years later in the Lord and you don't deal with any of that, but listen, do any of you remember haunting days when you first Amen. came to the Lord of I Amen. did this, I did that? You may have been a prostitute. Uh, you may have been a liar, a cheat, a thief. You may have done dirty deals financially that could have caught up to you at any time, wondering whether those things are going to happen or come down on you. Listen, this is where these people are coming from. A filthy, dirty, wicked world. Sinful ways, corrupt things, not thinking like you and I think. They haven't had their minds renewed through the reading of the world. They think street. They think, give me what I want. They don't understand what we understand. Amen. And let alone, do all of us understand what we understand? No. No. That's why we need to love the Lord. 
That's why our faith works by love. That's why our love is run by our faith. Amen. Hand in hand. The sorrows of death compass me and the pains of hell got hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Hey, like I said, I remember the carrying the gun. I remember the booze parties. I remember dark parties where there's one light on in a room and that's it. Little, little tiny bulb and it was red. So you're in the basement of a house. You can't see faces. So you don't know who's doing what or what's going on. Hey, I remember all that stuff. That's the devil's territory. Amen. He likes darkness, right? Yeah. So you're in the darkness. You don't know what somebody's doing with your soda, your beverage, your bottle, anything else. You don't know what's going on. Right. Sorrows of death. <clears throat> Pains of hell. God hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Man, I shared a long time ago about sitting in a room, and maybe you all can remember these days, sitting in a room by yourself, just blown out of your mind. Like, what is going on? What do I do? Okay, you were, I was smashed, drunk the night before, having a blast, and now all that low down, let down thing is there, and you're sitting there thinking, I don't want to go nowhere. I don't want to do anything. What's wrong with me? Uh, this is evil. I'm messed up. Amen. I found trouble and sorrow. How many folks woke up to find out they're pregnant? How many folks woke up to find out they got somebody pregnant and found out they barely know the person and what am I going to do? And how many stories we hear of people out looking for a mother or a father that they never met because it was just a one-nighter and that's it. Yeah. We don't want anything else to do with it or we never saw each other again. Yeah. I shared with you about a girl that got in touch with me that was looking for her father with my last name, only it was from somewhere else. She didn't know who her father was, so she's going through Facebook and Instagram and link. link Lincoln, LinkedIn or something, whatever it is, uh, those areas looking for faces, looking for identities, looking for somebody that has some resemblance. And before she got to him, he died. In fact, he just died last year. But I knew that because I got involved in a situation. But how many of those are there? Amen. It says, I found trouble and sorrow. So you've got a lineage there that doesn't know where it's from or what it's about or where it's going or what it should do. It kind of blends into wherever it's at, a, a life, a person. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Oh Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Man, my mind, my will, emotions, my soul, I'm messed up. Deliver me, help me. Get these things out of my mind. Get them out of my remembrance. I don't want to fight this battle anymore. Some of the new people say, you know, but I still go through this and I still fight that. And Listen, we need to understand that. They've been in drugs. They've been in weird relationships and everything else. Those things still are there. The imageries are still there. The devil wants to keep them there, but we've got the power in the name of Jesus to help them get through all that. Like we remembered. I can remember seeing people that I messed with back there in the world, like, uh-oh, what's going to go on? You know, it's only been a year or whatever back then. What's going to happen? Should I say hello? Should I not say hello? I remember what I did to them. That's there. That's there even now. Amen. The remembrance, but it's not a guilt and a condemnation anymore. Then called I on the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Listen, if you feel like you've been delivered from anything, gracious is the Lord Amen. and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. That's why we got to get across to people. Listen, God's not a legalist about, you know, you did this, you deserve to die now. No, there is all that, but
but he gave us all room to get it right. He gave us all room to repent. He shows he's merciful. He's gracious. Listen, he's made a way for you to just come on out of all that. And he's there to forgive you and cleanse you and get you right. Somebody may have puffed you up in your head that says you have all these rights. And before God, you have none of those rights. You remember, was it last week or the week before we talked about uh, what Leonard Ravenhill said? You, you talk about you love to go to the cross, but you won't get on the cross and die. And that's what Jesus called us to. Amen. You be dead and stop defending yourself. Stop fighting everybody to protect yourself. You'll never know who you are. You'll never find true Christ, the true Christ, as long as you're alive. Only when you die. From death comes life, right? Amen. What is it about a kernel of grain that falls into the ground? Won't bring forth any fruit unless it die. Amen. And then it brings forth multiple or manifold fruit. Amen. You take a kernel of corn and put it in the ground. You let it die. It rots, but it germinates and life springs forth. And now you've got five or six ears of corn that have what, 120 kernels per, per corn ear instead of just that one single one that you maybe kept and put on a shelf and you loved looking at it? But if you'd have put it in the ground, you'd have had all that to look at. What are we looking at? I called on the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and merciful. Or in, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. It's a good thing to sometimes say, listen, I don't know all the details, but I know the Bible says to do this. And I'm simply going to do what it says. God will work it out. God will bring it to pass. Amen. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low. Can you say I was brought low and he helped me? Amen. 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 All right, well, that's why we love the Lord. Let's go to a couple other things here. Um, Psalms 18, verse 1. I thought I'd just go through a couple of Psalms today. It says the same, I love the Lord, my strength. Is the Lord your strength? Is Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 alive in you? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The Lord is my strength, not my cunning, not my craftiness, not my Proverbs chapter 30, uh, my teeth that gnash at people whenever they try to correct me or instruct me. The Lord is my strength. Hey, I've lived through a lot of things. I'll live through this one too. Because it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Didn't he say where you're weak, you're weak he will make you strong? Amen. Right? Yeah. The Lord is my rock. What's the rock represent? It represents the wise man who built his house on the rock. It represents the foundation of the very gospel that we walk in and live in. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. You know what a fortress is. These, these block walls around us, they're like a fortress. They keep the wind from hitting us. They keep uh, evil people from coming directly into our presence. They have to go through outer ways or doorways to get in, and we have to somewhat let them in. He's our fortress. Means nothing has to get into us that we don't want in. Like Israel built defensed cities to keep evil out and to protect the people. He's our fortress, our protection, and my deliverer. If I find myself in something, a troublesome thing, or I've opened doors that I shouldn't have, Lord, what do I do now? You're my deliverer. He's my deliverer. He's my God. He's my strength. 
What I know I can't accomplish, my God can accomplish. All I have to do is call out to him. He knows before I even call what I need. My old story about being in the little bedroom with the bat up there and uh, flying bat, living bat, uh, and calling out to my father when he couldn't hear me because I wouldn't raise my voice. But finally, I yelled and he came and got the bat out of my room, off my back actually. But I cried out because before he couldn't hear me, he was asleep. He says, in whom I will trust. He is my buckler. That buckler, the Bible talks about him being our protector. He's like what the, uh, the reference to the word means, the scaly hide of a crocodile. You know how tough alligator skin is, crocodile skin? You know, if you ever had crocodile shoes or alligator shoes, it's that bumpy, rough, hard, protective coating on the gator. That's what he is to us. He's our protector and he's our defense. He says, the horn of my salvation. It's that place of grabbing on to the horns of the altar, the closeness to the Lord. But it's also about that horn of oil as was poured, as Samuel poured, and so on. The horn of oil uh, to anoint, to bless, to cover. He's the horn of my salvation and my high tower. In him we can see far down the road. In him we can see into the future, not in a mystical way, because he showed us everything through his word. So he's our high tower. We're not... Our enemies can't sneak up on us like that. We can see fire starting way down the road. Listen, that's why I've tried to it's be in, in the place I'm in, to warn people, listen, don't wait till this stuff happens. Start doing some things now. Start getting ready beforehand. When you hear them repeat, 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 this is what's going to be coming down the road. Pay attention. Even the ungodly know a lot of things that are going on in the world that you won't see locked up in your house. Amen. And your personal little lifestyle of I run to work, I do this, I do that. That's where I occupy myself till I die. And not aware of any of these things. It says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. Listen, everybody, just keep calling on the Lord. The Bible says that right there in 18.1, in, uh, that he's my strength. I love the Lord. He's my strength. Keep calling out to the Lord. Again, it goes through some of the same things. Floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Do you get a little scared about the fact of what? The Antichrist could be right around the corner. What? The governments are all coming together. I told you last week or the week before about they're now looking, the globalists are saying, we aren't going to be able to accomplish global unity, so we're going to segregate the globe into ten spheres, exactly like the Bible talks about. Remember I told you the Club of Rome uh, back years ago had the same idea, but the map is different now. The Club of Rome wanted world dominion and world power. Everybody wants world dominion and world power. Do you know what? And they'll accuse you of wanting to take over the world. But listen, we're not after the world. We're after the kingdom. Amen. We want you and them and they and everybody out there to make it to the kingdom. Because this world, the Bible says, is going to be dissolved, right? With fervent heat and a loud noise. Which means we should be a manner of men that is not like the manner of average men in the world. Because we know this is going to be dissolved. He said, the sorrows of death compass me and floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compass me about. And the snares of death prevented me in my distress. I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God, and he heard my voice out of his temple. I got one of the songs I think we put on for today, that uh, Casting Crowns, that song, has anybody 
Uh, or can anybody see her? It's about being right under the church steeple and nobody realizing this girl's broken, this person's broken because they're always running. And listen, you as believers in Christ, if you keep yourself always running because you know that you're not going to get dealt with that way, come on, you're running from God. Amen. You're fr running from the work of uh, what I talked about, hiding under the pillow or under the covers because you don't want to deal with something. We're not to deal like that. We're not to live like that. Christ has greater things for us. In those little areas we think we're so small and so immature, he'll make us strong if we'll yield to him in those things. So he said, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his holy temple. Listen, his holy temple means he's the priest in there. He's the great high priest, but he wasn't so occupied with what was going on there that he couldn't hear you cry. He couldn't hear you call out. He wasn't like Eli the priest when he heard Hannah and saw her lips moving and he doesn't assume you're drunken or you're just stressed out of your mind or being weird. No, he hears. And my cry came before him even in his ears. Amen? Amen. Uh, let's go to Psalm 26, verse 8. And uh, I don't know, you might say after this what I said about I don't need to go to church. Psalm 26, verse 8 says, I have loved the habitation of thy house. What was that? It was the temple of the living God. It was where God met the people. He said, I love thy habitation, the habitation of thy house. It's his abode. It's his dwelling place. Any of you that had grandparents that you loved? Amen. You loved going to their house? You loved just sitting there with them? This is their house. I love your habitation. This is wonderful. I feel peace here. I feel rest here. I feel safe and secure here. The psalmist is saying, I love your habitation. The habitation of your house, it's where you are. Hey, listen, you know, a lot of us have had uh, grandparents and so on that passed, and we had to go to their house, whatever. You, you know they're not there, but you walk through the rooms and you have good memories of your early days. Not me with my grandmother. I used to tell you how all I ever remember is she chased me with sticks. She'd yell at me. I don't remember any other times than those kind of times as far as much as I've tried to think it out. Uh, when I am with my cousins, I sometimes want to ask them what they remember, but I'm afraid it might have just been me. Uh, but you walk through the house and you think about, gee, when I was six years old, I remember this. Some of you girls, you might say, I remember my grandma teaching me how to bake over here. That's the same stove we used, you know, when she kept all those little canisters up there with the spices and the flour and whatever the case may be. You love that. You don't remember your grandma chasing you with a stick, do you? <laughs> That's what I remember. Uh, anyway. I don't remember God chasing me with the stick. Amen. So I love his habitation. Right? That's what it says here. I have loved the habitation of the, thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. That word honor there means his glory dwelt. Amen. I know his glory can fall anywhere. I know that full well. I've shared testimonies of being in hotel rooms and just walking in the door and it was like, boom, the weight of the Lord fell and like, gosh, being totally set free from something. Being in the woods walking or being out here running a mower or any of that type of stuff. God's glory can come on us anywhere. Amen. But what he's saying here is there was such a preciousness in the house of God. Listen, if we stop and think back of all the years of ministry, I can remember all the way back to the house in the 70s and the L&K restaurants and 
people getting delivered and set free and times of praise and worship in the parks and various things way back then. There was no format to anything. We just came and worshiped. That's why sometimes I get upset when we have to come in and we have to sing songs and we have to get everybody in the prepared mode of, okay, now I can listen because I've done all this. And like, what happens if God moves and we just do something that's totally different, although it's biblical, and I don't mean different in the sense of it's out in space somewhere. I mean, it's biblical, but the Lord moves and it's like it just begins and goes. Amen. You know how much I long to see people set free from stuff that I know they are still holding on to like little children, like little brats that we all can be at certain times. They refuse to let go and don't understand that once you let go, there's a whole new format here for you. Amen. This is where it's at. This is what the Lord will do. Because every one of us could hold on to that old life. But thank God we let go of most of it. We need to keep letting go. Keep letting go. Keep trusting. Keep walking. Keep grabbing the horns of the altar. Keep having that anointing oil poured on our heads as we continue to go. I have loved the habitation of thy house. Hey, your grandfather might have hung out in the garage a lot. And you might remember that you went out there with him and he showed you how to work on the car or how to fix the rototiller and uh, different things. And he might have said to you, hey, son, sit down. I want to talk to you for a minute. Told you a little story and you sat there. You're younger, maybe a teenager, and thinking, what in the world does he mean by that? He gets up and walks away and comes back a little bit later and says, now, You've been thinking about what I said? Let me tell you what I meant by that. Let me tell you some things about life that you're going to face down the road. Or he might have said to you, like I've done with some of mine, uh, even, well, I won't mention any area, but hey, listen, you know, your parents don't actually understand everything either. And they've had some hard times. Amen. They've been through some experiences that they may not tell you about. So you may need to let me tell you that they have hurts and they can't help you with everything because there's areas of them that need help. And so you're going to have to listen and know that you can sort of be like an adult yourself and realize that maybe they need to hear you be the adult sometimes and it may change them somewhat because you don't know everything they've gone through you don't know what's been said to them you don't know what's been done to them and that needs to be taken into consideration so as a grandfather I've had to do that and I've had to say well listen you're getting to be a young teenager or an older teenager or whatever I guess it's time to grow up Realize that's how life is. Yeah, you've been dealt some wrong, but you know what? Are you going to turn and do evil because of it? Or are you going to do what's right? And leave it lay where, where it lays, right? Amen. So he says, And the place where thy glory or your splendor dwells. And listen, I really, if I pass, I really could care if they just close the casket and nobody sees me that way. I'd rather people remember me for being alive. There were people that would like to kill you anyway, but <laughs> that they remember you being alive. Maybe that'll be a thing in their minds where they go, well, I always wish that, I always wish that. But I keep thinking about how he was alive about this and talked about that. Maybe that'll be the little thorn in their side. Remember the place where, and we're talking about God. So listen, that's far beyond us talking about each other. Amen. Where there was a time where we entered into praise and worship and you experienced such holiness as though the Lord was right there in our presence. Such a closeness, such a, you know, I'm so broken, I'm so messed up, but you are so good. So he says, 
I have loved the habitation of thy house, just coming together in, in your holy place, in the right place where you are, because you're there. And listen, if there's little quibblings or whatever, that doesn't matter. He's here. I didn't come for all that. I came for him. But you're a part of all that. And the place where thy glory or thy honor or thy splendor dwells. He says, Lord, gather not my soul with, <clears throat> excuse me, with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. I came out of all that. Don't let me be back in all that. And don't let the end of my life be with the end of their lives. Keep me. Yes. Amen? Amen. Psalm 40, verse 16. Excuse my voice. <clears throat> says, let all those that seek thee, seek the Lord, rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Do you love his salvation today? Do you love his house? Do you love the place where his honor dwells? Do you love him uh, because he heard you? If anything out of this today, I said that last week about loving the Lord. You know, if people love the Lord, they'll be where he is. Always remember that. If they love you enough, they'll let other things go by the wayside. If you love the Lord enough, you'll let those things go by the wayside. You'll be where he is. You'll be where his glory is. Do you love his salvation? Look what the Lord has done for me. His salvation. We love it more. Remember Jesus said those who are forgiven much, love much. Amen. Hey, the more I go along, the more I realize, man, I was forgiven of a lot. Amen. So as we go along in this life, we should realize we need to love him all the more. We've been forgiven more and more. We understand I was so corrupt and so ugly and so foul. I was dead. I was in a casket. I was buried. My bones were rotten away or my flesh and everything else. And yet he raised me up. I never thought about myself like that until a couple years ago. As long as I've been walking with the Lord, I don't know, 46 or 7 years now, whatever the case. I mean, I knew I was bad. I knew I had problems. But no, it was so much more. So let all those that seek thee rejoice. So this morning, rejoice if you're seeking him. <clears throat> Be glad in him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. What did John the Baptist say? I must decrease that he may increase, or he must increase that I decrease. Uh, it's not about me, it's not about you. It's about him. It's about him being allowed to live through us, <clears throat> that his honor, his glory, his splendor be revealed in us, that we serve the Lord and we prove what he said. So, you may go to the Lord saying, Lord, and maybe you don't even do this. I don't know. Maybe you just go talking to him about what you want, what you need, what you think. But if you ever go to him saying, Lord, do you love me? Don't be surprised if he says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Hey, I hear you. Do you love me? Remember, he said it three different times, a little bit different every time. If you love me, what should you be doing? Feeding my sheep, ministering to my people, keeping the flock, the saints, working in the field of the ministry of the things of God. Amen? Amen. Oh, yeah, and don't be like uh, Peter at that point in time. And Well, I hear you, Jesus, but what about him? Remember that? What are you going to do with John over there, the guy who, uh, you know, what, what about him? Well, with him, whatever I decide to do, I decide to do. 
you worry about you. So you said you love me, but when you start that finger pointing thing, is that really what it's about? Amen. Isn't it great to always deflect what you don't like onto somebody else? You don't have to do that anymore. It's time for all of us to grow and mature in the Lord. Amen. Well, Father, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for this word. I want to say I love you, and I pray that I'm feeding your sheep. I pray that I'm giving them fresh manna, fresh food, a healthy diet, Lord God. Now, we all, we stuff ourselves in the flesh with all kinds of fast foods and things that have almost no nutrition or no value or, or no good to us whatsoever that cause problems down the road. And I pray that what I'm ministering and feeding the flock isn't going to breed problems down the road, but it's going to be life in every one of our members. I thank you this morning for anybody listening in and those of us that are here gathered together. Uh, Father, that the word have place in every one of us, that it accomplish what you sent it to do this morning in Jesus' name. And I bind the fowls of the air. The Bible talks about the fowls, the birds that come to steal the seeds of truth. I bind those right now, and I just pray in every one that we don't dismiss the gospel. Lord, we don't deflect the gospel to somebody else. But we say, Lord, here am I. I thank you for that. And if you're out there listening this morning and listen, you feel broken. We can all understand that. We can all relate to that. There are days that I've been walking with the Lord now 40 some years. And some days I still wonder, am I messed up? Uh, although I know the Lord's doing a good work in my life and I'm thankful for everything. So this morning, if you've never met Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Amen. That call means a call of desperation. You really want help. You really want out of where you are. The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, and you believe that in your heart, then you can be saved. The Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said there's not one that is righteous, no, not one. You're a sinner just like we were sinners. You can be cleansed just like we are cleansed. And you can have faith and trust in God and a relationship with the Lord just like we now do. And it's all because of his word. And it's not something that you have to overcome everything today to say now I'll go ahead and serve the Lord. No, you come to him. He'll work a work in you that you won't believe. He'll change your heart. And that's your greatest battle. It's in your heart. It's in your desires. It's what you love to do. He'll change that for you and make you a new person according to the gospel. He says he'll give you a new heart and a right spirit. That's the covenant that we are uh, cutting with God in all of this. But if you will confess the Lord Jesus, ask him to forgive you of your sin right now, you may say, I'm not sure what all sins I've committed. That's okay. Start with whatever you think of. If you've been a liar, if you've been a cheat, if you've been a deceiver, if you've been uh, having premarital sexual relationships, uh, if you've thought evil and hated people or even murdered somebody. The Bible says God forgives all sin. There's only one sin that's not forgivable, and that you can't have accomplished yet because you haven't known all the truth. So the Bible is clear that God waits to pardon and forgive us because he is so merciful and just. He's not waiting to destroy you. He would that none perish. That's why he sent Christ. This morning, if you'll ask him to forgive you, Ask Jesus to come into your life, be your Lord and Savior. He will begin to work on your behalf. You need to get in the church. You need to hear the word and grow in the word of God. Uh, the Bible says that if we have received Christ Jesus the Lord, or as we have received him, so we should walk in him. We'll teach you how to walk with the Lord. 
And that's what you need. It's not a one-time prayer. Everything's over and done. You get to go to heaven. It's a relationship being built. This is a starting point where Christ will work in your life and you'll know the difference. In fact, when I first came to Jesus, the day I prayed with some men in a parking lot, the next day I never touched the booze again. And my mouth was totally cleaned up. And I did neither one of those. It was the power of God. He can do the very same for you. So, Father, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for those that have listened in. I just pray you stir them, touch them. I pray you strengthen every one of us. We thank you for this time and thank you for your church. You told us to gather together as the fellowship of the saints, the place of your habitation. You said you'd walk in the midst of your candlesticks in Revelation. That's your church. And so we thank you for that today and give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, we ask it all. And may God bless you that listened out there. If you've asked him to come into your life today, get in a good church, a church that's going to read the Bible to you and teach you biblical principles. Listen, the world's got a lot of stuff that's thrown around right now. You need to hear what Christ taught, what he told us to do, how he told us to live, because that's the way of salvation. And he will bless you, and you'll be glad down the road that you prayed today, that you listened along, that you made this decision uh, to follow Jesus. God bless. Amen. Amen.